Okay. So, as I said, we've been going through, we've been going through the Gospels. So far, we've looked at the whole first chapter of Luke. We've looked at a little bit of Matthew, and we've looked at one verse of John. And then we are now going through, so this was like before Jesus' birth, and then that was also pretty much before Jesus' birth, and then Matthew 2 is Jesus' birth. And we're now looking at stuff. And so, so far we've had like, we had the birth of Jesus, then we had the shepherds that God announced the birth of the Messiah to, and they came and worshipped Him. And we did that over two weeks, I think. Yeah, so that's where we left off. And so today we're going to continue with Luke chapter 2 and see what happens next. So, this is what comes next. After the shepherds, remember at the end of, when we finished last time, basically the shepherds went back to look after their sheep and praised and glorified God on the way. And that was how it ended. And then this is how the story continues. Now when the time came for the purification according to the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Just as it was written in the law, law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be set apart to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is specified in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So the next thing that happens in the story of Jesus is that Mary and Joseph take Jesus to Jerusalem to offer some sacrifices. Yeah? Okay. And it says that this happened when the time for their purification according to the law was, well, when the time came for it. This takes us all the way back to Exodus to understand what's going on here. What happens in the book of Exodus? Mm -hmm. Why? What's the context? Yeah, so the book of Exodus, Genesis is everything basically in history up until the point that the, the, the Jewish people go, go into Egypt. And then Exodus starts like 400 years later. They've been in Egypt for 400 years and they're now slaves to the Pharaoh, building his cities and things. And, so, and then it starts with their cry to God, save us from slavery to the, to the Pharaoh. And so he calls Moses to do that. And then, of course, Moses goes and says, God has said to let his people go. And Pharaoh says, what God? I'm God. I don't care what your God says. Like, who cares? So anyway, and so then you have, and then there's like this series of plagues, right? Where God's revealing himself to Pharaoh and forcing him, forcing his hand, basically. Forcing him to recognize that God is greater than he is and he needs to do what God says. And one, two, three, four, you have all of these plagues until eventually... The, the last plague, the one that finally broke through his hard heart and he then let them go was this death of the firstborn, that God killed every firstborn child and animal in the entire land of Egypt. Except? Yeah, except he spared the, the Israelites, firstborn children, firstborn animals provided that they sacrificed a lamb and painted its blood on their, the doors of their houses. Yeah? Passover. Okay. Mm. Now, immediately after that, God said to his people, set apart from, to me, set apart to me every firstborn male, the firstborn offspring of every womb among the Israelites, whether human or animal, it is mine. That's the verse that Luke is quoting that we just read. Set apart to me every firstborn. What's God saying? Do you think? All the firstborn are mine. Are mine. Correct. Why do you think he's saying that? Born 
Uh, maybe. Basically, he goes on to say that essentially God has shown mercy to Israel, right? By, they, by sparing them the suffering that came on the rest of the land of Egypt. And, the, and he did that on the basis that they offered this lamb, that something else died in their place, basically. And God basically says, like, so that you never forget what I did for you here, going, first, f- going forward, all your firstborns are going to belong to me. And if you don't want to kill them, you have to redeem them. You have to buy them back from me with the blood of a lamb. And he says like that obviously applies to your kids, no sacrificing kids, but they belong to me. You have to redeem them. You have to come and you have to sacrifice a lamb to keep them. And he says, even your donkeys, if you have a donkey that's born and it's the first donkey from that mom donkey, I don't know, are they mares? I don't know. If you want to keep it, if you don't want it to, if you don't want to sacrifice it to me, you need to sacrifice a lamb in its place. Redeem it. Why do you think he's, well, as we said, the purpose is so that they never forget what happened in Egypt. And he actually goes on and says exactly that. He says, in the future, when your son asks you, what is this? Like, why are we doing this? Why are we sacrificing this lamb just because a donkey got born? You are to tell him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to release us, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of people to the firstborn of animals. That is why I am sacrificing to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb, but all my firstborn sons I redeem. It will be a sign on your hand and for frontlets on your forehead, for with a mighty hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So he's basically saying, like, li- this is literally, you're going to be able to, f- a sign that you can feel with your hands. When the blood of the lamb, you know, blood of the animals on your hands, you're going to be, a- and, it- and you're going to be able to see it. And it's always going to remind you of what God did for you when he saved you. The Orthodox Jews like take this even more literally. They, they actually take a piece of scripture and they put it in a little box and they tie it onto their arm and onto their forehead so that the, the word of God is always, that's what he said, right? Will be a sign on your hands and frontlets on your forehead. It'll always be before your eyes. (laughs) Yeah. But anyway, so that's the idea. God basically says, from now on, the firstborn are all going to belong to me and you have to redeem them so that you never forget what happened, happened here. Later, that law gets formalized in what the Jewish people called the law of Moses. But really, it's the law of God that he gave to Moses. And that's Leviticus mostly. And so in the book of Leviticus, it says that when a woman gives birth to a child, she's going to be considered unclean for seven days. On the eighth day, if it's a male, a boy, then you circumcise them, which we saw a couple of weeks ago, I think, as well, with Jesus. And then she will remain unclean for another 33 days. So 40 days. Now, the reason for that, like, as far as I know, there's like technical reasons to do with like the blood that's involved with childbirth and that sort of thing. But I think it also served quite a practical purpose because for those 40 days that she was considered unclean, for a start, like, that basically relieved her of any of the responsibilities she would normally have in life. So she was free to rest, recover, bond with the baby. Um, Today we call that maternity leave, right? And then the other thing is babies are not born with very strong immune systems. So even today, it's not uncommon for new parents to ask friends and that like not to visit for a few weeks after the child's been born, right? At least until they've been vaccinated. And of course, there's no vaccines back then. So I think it was also helpful to um, basically allow the mum and the baby to isolate for some amount of time after birth 
sort of protect the baby until its immune system had developed. And so anyway, so there's a, there's a whole bunch of reasons why, why, why the mother was supposed to isolate herself for 40 days after giving birth. But then it says, when the days of her purification are completed for a son or for a daughter, she must bring a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering to the entrance of the meeting tent to the priest. The priest is to present it before the Lord and make atonement on her behalf, and she will be clean from her flow of blood. This is the law to the one of the one who bears a child for the male or the female child. If she cannot afford a sheep, then she must take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for a burnt offering and one for a sin offering, and the priest is to make atonement on her behalf and she will be clean. So that is that that was the law. The, the days of purification, these 40 days, is that after the 40 days were over, then the mom was supposed to present herself before God, offer a sacrifice, and uh, at that time, they're in the wilderness, so you did that at the meeting, the, the tabernacle, the meeting tent, which is what it talks about, but by the time of Jesus' birth, you're doing this where? In the temple in Jerusalem, yeah. And so, that's exactly what Mary and Joseph did. 40 days after Jesus was born, they made the um, about 10 kilometer journey from a little town of Bethlehem up to the magnificent temple in Jerusalem. Take about two to three hours to walk it. And that was the first time Jesus came to Jerusalem in his life, first of many. Um, and why is he going there? To offer the sacrifice, right? To basically to keep God's law, to fulfill the commandments that God had given his people. And so again, Jesus is Jewish in every way. He was born to Jewish parents. He was circumcised like all the other Jewish boys. He was raised in a Jewish family that kept the Jewish law. He went to Jerusalem to offer the sacrifices exactly the way God told him to. He lived as a Jew, keeping every single law every single one of God's commands, and he died as a Jew, as a foreigner on a Roman cross, because that's what foreign, that's, yeah, you didn't kill Romans on a cross, only foreigners. And so the Savior that we worship is, an, is Israel's Messiah, like we're sharing in their salvation, not the other way around. Anyway, so Mary and Joseph went and offered a sacrifice, and it says that they offered a pair of doves or two young pigeons according to what is specified in the law. What does that tell us? Yeah, exactly. If you remember what we just read in Leviticus, it said that the mom was supposed to offer a lamb. I'm guessing that's dating, like going back to Exodus and, the, and for redeeming the child is offering the lamb. And then she's supposed to offer a pigeon or a dove as a sin offering, which I'm guessing is for herself. But, but it said... If you can't afford, I put that there. If you can't afford a sheep, then you can offer two pigeons instead. Which I really love, because it basically means like nobody's left out of God's law. Nobody's excluded. Anybody can get a bird. Like pigeons are everywhere. <laughs> like even if you can't afford to buy a pigeon, you can go and catch one. You know? I don't we used to do that. Do you have you ever caught it's probably not probably not good anymore but we used to make these little uh thingies that um this little trap like you never hurt the bird but like it was like a, a a wire mesh uh dome that was sitting up on a thing and there was some food in there and when they came in it would like trigger it and it would fall down on and like have them inside there and then you, anyway they're not hard to catch put it that way <laughs> pretty stupid i play with it and let it go <laughs> Uh. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, so it tells us that Mary and Joseph were poor. They couldn't afford a sheep. What does that tell us? It's actually quite an important clue to timing of things. Maybe. What hasn't happened yet?
in the story of Jesus' birth? The? The three wise men. The wise men. On your Christmas cards, the wise men are there with the sheep, well, with the shepherds, right? Around the, in the stable, around the baby Jesus. But that's probably not the case, which we'll see. Yeah, basically, like that, it seems like they came probably a year maybe later after Jesus was born. One of the clues that gives that away is the fact that, like, what they brought gifts, including gold. It doesn't make sense if they just received a gift from these wise men of gold that they go to the temple and they can't afford a lamb. Like, where'd you spend all your money? You know? That's the one thing. The other thing is, like, if you remember, the wise men start in Jerusalem with King Herod. And they basically say to Herod, where's the, like, because Herod was not Jewish. He's like a fake king of Israel. And they basically say to Herod, where's the real king who's been born? And Herod's like, what? There's a new king? And he decides he wants to kill Jesus. And that's why they have to flee to Egypt. And so again, it it seems very unlikely that if the wise men had already come and Herod now knew that there was this Messiah, this king of Israel that had been born, that they would have been able to go to Jerusalem to offer these sacrifices when Herod's seeking to kill Jesus. You know what I mean? And so... So, I don't think the wise men were there on the night that Jesus was born. I think they probably came later. And I think that that delay was probably intentional. That God intentionally delayed the wise men so that Mary and Joseph would have the time to go and offer these sacrifices in the way that they were supposed to. So that Jesus later could say, don't think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I haven't come to abolish these things, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter will pass from the law until everything takes place. That Jesus perfectly kept the law of God. Every single one of them, 613, I think, in the Old Testament. He perfectly kept God's law and he did it on our behalf. He kept it so that we don't have to. And then he basically said, like, want to swap? I'll give you my righteousness, the righteousness that I have earned by perfectly keeping God's law, and I'll take your sin. It's a pretty good deal, yeah. And then he took that sin and destroyed it on the cross, which is pretty amazing. And that's, that's what Paul says uh, to the Corinthians. He says, God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. So he became sin on our behalf so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. We could receive, become righteous. And just as through the disobedience of, this is in Romans, the one man, just as through the disobedience of the one man, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. Who's the one man through which many were made sinners? Yeah. In Romans 5, Paul makes this real cool, like, like he gives a whole bunch of comparisons between Adam, Jesus, Adam, Jesus, Adam, Jesus. And this is one of them. He's like, Adam sinned and a whole lot of people became sinners. Jesus obeyed and a whole bunch of people were made righteous. Yeah. So anyway, pretty cool. Now, then we're told, somebody want to read? Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout, looking for the restoration of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord, the Lord's Christ. So Simeon, directed by the Spirit, came into the temple courts and when the parents brought the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary according to the law, Simeon took him in his arms and bless God, saying, Now according to your word, Sovereign Lord, permit your servant to depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in your presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Cool. 
So we're told that there's this guy living in Jerusalem called Simeon. Simeon is a different version of Simon, the name Simon, and that comes from a Hebrew name, Shimeon, which was one of Jacob's sons and one of the tribes of Israel. Tribes of Israel. And this Simeon apparently was a righteous and devout person. He was a good man, and he had the Holy Spirit on him. And apparently the Holy Spirit had told him that he would not die before he sees the Messiah, the Lord's Christ. Remember, we talked about Christ is just the Greek version. It, like, it's the Greek word that means what the Hebrew word Messiah means. They mean the same thing. They both mean anointed one. And so the Holy Spirit told Simeon that he wouldn't die before he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. Now, there were some clues that the Messiah was coming. For a start, Remember when John the Baptist was born, his father Zechariah gave a whole long prophecy, the speech, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, because he has come to help and has redeemed his people. For he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouths of his holy prophets from long ago, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. So he says, God has raised up a horn like this power of salvation for us out of the house of his servant, David. He's not talking about his son. He's not talking about John because John was not from the house of David. He was from the house of Levi. He was a priest. So who's he, who's he talking about here? Jesus, right? Who's going to save us from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. And then he later, he talks about his son. He says, you child will be called the prophet of the most high for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of his sins. And so Zechariah had prophesied that his son was going to be the, the, the one who paved the way for the Messiah. Yeah. And remember, there was all sorts of like, Elizabeth was old. Don't know how old, but pretty old. Way too old to be having kids. Like there was all sorts of miracles going on with, uh, their, with John the Baptist's birth. And so it says that all their neighbors were filled with fear and throughout the entire hill country of Judea, all these things were talked about. All the stuff that was going on with John the Baptist and the things that were being said about him, apparently that news sp spread everywhere at least all through the hill country of Judea, which includes Jerusalem. And so it's, and this is only about six months ago that John the Baptist was born. And so it's likely that Simeon has heard this rumors coming out of, Heb well, wherever the little town was that Zechariah and Elizabeth were, that there was this child that had been born that was apparently going to lead the way for the Messiah. So that's kind of a clue that where we are. And then there's also, remember that prophecy that we've looked at a bunch of times in Daniel in the Old Testament, about 600 BC, where Gabriel told Daniel that there was going to be a command issued to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. At the time that this prophecy comes, Jerusalem is in complete ruins. It was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar about 70 years earlier. That there's a command, there's going to be a command issued to rebuild Jerusalem. And from that command until the Messiah, the prince arrives, there'll be a period of seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is how many weeks? 69, 69 weeks. And the, we, the word weeks in Hebrew is just seven. So it'll be, there'll be 69 sevens. And the question is seven what's? Yeah, so in Jewish culture, you had weeks of days, seven days. You had weeks of months, which is like with Pentecost. And then you had weeks of years and you had a Sabbath year every seven years when you weren't supposed to farm and that kind of stuff. And from the context, we understand that this is weeks of years. So it's 69 periods of seven weeks, of seven years. Did you calculate? 483. Sorry? 483. 483 years. And so there's this prophecy in Daniel from 600 BC that basically says from the time that the command is issued to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince arrives, there's 483 years. And 
that was pretty much up. The, uh, the command to rebuild Jerusalem, I think, was in 444 BC, something like that. It was 483, and anyway, there's some other maths around that. But basically, Daniel's prophecy, this was, they were living in that time, within that generation, you know? Um, yeah. And so I suspect there's a chance at least that Simeon knew this prophecy from Daniel might also have known that the time was close. But none of that is what brought him to the temple on that day that Jesus was there. What did? Yeah. Yeah. Says Simeon was directed by the Holy Spirit. That's how he ended up there on that day, and I think that's that's kind of cool because, like, as I say, I have no doubt that Simeon loved God's word, the Old Testament that he had at that time, and probably knew it through and through. Like, they memorized the scripture back then, word for word. There's also. Uh, I don't know if you've heard Jewish people read scripture, but it's kind of like sort of melodic. They almost sing it. And I like, you know how easy, how much easier it is to learn things in song? Yeah. So I think that was part of it as well. It made it easier to memorize it because, yeah. And so anyway, he probably knew God's word through and through, might have known every single word of it off by heart, but that wasn't that that on its own wasn't enough to get him to the temple on the day that Jesus was there, right? There's something else that he needed. What? Yeah, he also needed to know God's spirit, to know God's voice. That's what would, that's what leads him personally. Like the scripture can teach you general truth, but the question is, how do you, how do you know what God's saying to you today? What he wants you to do today? You know, personally leading you personally. And that's the Holy Spirit. And that's what brought him there there that day. Now, thankfully, as believers, we all have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, we looked at that last week. Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, another helper to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot accept because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he resides, he lives with you and will be in you. And again, Paul said something very similar to the Corinthians. He said, it is God who establishes us together with you in Christ and who anointed us, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a down payment. So as a believer, if you've entrusted your life to God, you have his spirit in you. And God's Spirit will speak to you. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will show you what God wants you to do, when God wants you to do it. Or at least he'll he'll try if you're listening. A lot of the time, I'm not listening, (laughs) unfortunately. But how should I ask the question? How should I ask the question? Like, how many of you guys know that you have the Holy Spirit in you? Okay, good. How many of you hear him speak to you? Okay. What do you mean by directly? Okay. How? It is hard. I'm not not pretending like it's not. I'm not, yeah. Uh huh. That's super cool, right? Yeah, yeah. I've that was definitely something that like stood out to me. Was yeah, exactly like you say. Like that asking question. My first thought is, I got no idea what the answer to that question is. And then the next minute, I've answered the question. I'm like, I don't know where that came from. Yeah, yeah super, super cool. How else? What about the rest of you guys? Yeah. Feel him doing like how? Just like I feel him speaking. 
Mm. Yeah, I think probably most people who will hopefully be able to relate to that. I don't know if I could have related to that at your age, if I'm honest, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Who, do any of you like feel him or hear him here? And I, obviously I'm using here in a symbolic way, right? I don't know. Maybe some of you have heard a voice from God. I, I believe that happens sometimes. Never happened to me. That's not the hearing I'm talking about, but you still hear. Like God still speaks to you. But how have any, any of you guys, do you find God like the Holy Spirit, I guess, telling you to do something or speak to someone or like guiding you in that way? Okay. How do you recognize that it's, how do you know it's the Holy Spirit doing that? If there's a difference. Yeah. Any other thoughts? That's super cool. Why did you talk to her? Felt like you should. Did you want to? That's super. That's so so cool. So, I would say like in my experience, uh, what the Holy Spirit sounds like, so to speak is some thought or feeling that I get that I should do something or not do something, maybe. And part of the way that I recognize that it's the Holy Spirit, I think, is because my first instinct is, uh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's usually, it's usually prompting me to do something that I, that I would not otherwise want to do. And even maybe in this, I still don't want to do it. Like, it's just, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's usually how the Holy Spirit speaks to me. It's just this, let's say. And, and uh, also, like, I think, I think that's something else. Like, God, God can speak to you through His Word, through Scripture. And He can speak to you personally. Have any, any of you experienced that? Where you're reading Scripture and, like, Something in scripture is speaking to you in a very specific way to a situation you're in, and you're like, oh, okay, okay, God, I get it. Like, you know, that I think is the Holy Spirit because we have the scriptures, you can read it. And most of the time, 99% of the time that I'm reading this, I'm reading it, and my brain's just thinking about what it says. Every now and again, something goes poof, out at me, it just jumps out, and I'm like, God's that's for me right now. And any other time that I read that verse, it would have just gone right through and just been like everything else, you know? I think that that, I think God speaking personally to us through his word comes through the scriptures, uh, th through his spirit in us, as opposed to just from the word itself. Um, so there's that, but then there's also like, yeah, this like prodding to do something. Something will come to my mind and it's not what I would want to do. So where the heck is that coming from? And say usually i think that's the holy spirit i don't know that it always is and i think that one of the ways that you can become more sensitive to the holy spirit or accurate in terms of like figuring out is this the holy spirit or not is by actually doing it you know when you feel god when you feel something in you saying go and speak to that person my reaction is no <laughs> i'm not feeling extroverted I'm going to go do something else. But you go and speak to that person and then you find out they're in that situation and there's like no question in your mind that God put this together and he brought you there to speak to her in that moment. Then it's like, wow, that was God, you know? And then it's going to be more, it's going to be easier to recognize it next time to be like, this is probably like that other situation, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So anyway, 
We're very fortunate, not only to have God's Word, which is absolutely amazing, but also to have His Spirit. And that's, it's the Spirit that brought Simeon to that temple that day, at the time that Jesus was there. And I think it was God's Spirit that caused him, when he saw that little baby, because I don't know that he was expecting a baby, told him, that's, that's the one, that's the Messiah. Now, I suspect Simeon was fairly old. Don't know this, but I suspect so because he took Jesus in his arms and blessed God saying, basically, let me die now. <laughs> let me depart in peace because I've seen your Messiah. Maybe he's just being, you know, just saying, okay, cool. Uh, I'm satisfied with my life, whatever happens. But I also wonder if he's old and he's like, okay, I've hung around now. I've seen your Messiah. Let me go. But he says the reason why he's happy to die is because my eyes have seen your salvation. And I think that's super cool because if he was speaking in Hebrew, don't know if he was, but what would he have said there? My eyes have seen your? Savior? What's the Hebrew for Savior? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it's Yeshua, right? That's the Hebrew word for Messiah and Yeshua is where the name Jesus comes from. It's, it's the Hebrew version. We looked at that last week, how you got from Yeshua to Jesus the whole, through a whole bunch of different languages. But basically, the word there, if he was speaking in Hebrew, he would have said, my eyes have seen your Jesus, holding Jesus, <laughs> which is really cool. That you have prepared in the presence of all your people. And then I love the way that he describes this salvation, Jesus. He says he is a light. What is that? Where does that take your mind? Anywhere? Jesus, many years later, in exactly the same city, in Jerusalem, says, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So I think that's super cool. You have Simeon basically saying what Jesus is going to say about himself many years later. He's a light. But how is Jesus a light? How does following him, the one who follows me, how does that mean you won't have to walk in darkness? Okay, yeah. How's that a light? Yeah, yeah. I mean, sin in your life brings darkness for sure. We talked about that a lot at the end of last year when we talked about like the, if you eat from this tree, you will surely die and what that death looks like. And obviously there's physical death, you die. There's spiritual death, but there's also just like, it just causes death in your life. Um, darkness, yeah, pain, suffering, all sorts of things. Hurts you, hurts everybody around you. So yeah. And then how is Jesus the how how does Jesus help in that? How does he prevent you from being in darkness? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Good. How how else? How is Jesus a light in the darkness? Jesus is truth. If we what he speaks is truth, then we have eternal life with him and a world full of sin. That he is a light, a beacon of hope to everyone. Uh huh. What does light do? See things. You can see things. Is that useful? <laughs> pretty much right because what do you light yeah like by very definition you cannot see without light what do you do in a room that's completely dark sorry so it's still in hyperventilate that's right you don't like the dark <laughs> but you're not the only one who's going to be sitting still you can't like what do you do you don't know where anything is. You don't know what 
like if you're in a pitch black room and somebody spins you around 10 times, you're lost, right? You don't know where anything is. You don't know what obstacles are in front of you that you're going to trip over, what dangers are out there. You know, you've got, you're, you're lost. You're scared and lost and you cannot do anything. Light allows you to see. It allows you to figure out what direction to go and it allows you to move forward with confidence. If this room is dark, like, how do you move? You do those things, those games, right? We have to, and you don't, you're constantly, what am I gonna walk into, et cetera, right? Whereas when it's light, there's no problem. You walk with confidence. I know where I'm going because I know the table's there, yeah? That's very much what I think is going on here. Because with Jesus, we have light, we can see. Our life has a purpose, it has a goal, it has something we can actually aim at. We know what direction to walk, you know? We're not left to like, just as I say, wander around aimlessly, feeling around in the dark, trying to, go, trying to figure out where to go. We have somebody to follow. So he says, you follow me, you won't be in darkness, you'll know the way to go. He allows us to see, everything makes sense. And he makes sense of everything. And he shows us the way to go. Now what's really cool is David said basically the same thing about a thousand years earlier in the Psalms. He said, your word is a lamp for my foot and a light for my path. So word is, God's word is a light. It illuminates the path. It allows you to see the path and it allows you to know where to put your feet. And who is the word of God? Jesus, yeah. <laughs> so Jesus is the word of God. See how like all comes full circle? Always comes back to Jesus. Jesus is the light. The light for my foot, the light for my path. Yeah, so anyway, this Jesus, God's salvation, his Yeshua is a light. And what does the light do? It says that it brings revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. There's so much that we could go into there that we do not have time to do properly this morning. But, check this verse from Isaiah. God says, I take hold of your hands. I protect you. I make you a covenant mediator for people and a light to the nations to open blind eyes, to release prisoners from dungeons, those who live in darkness from prison. Who's speaking? Do you think? Well, it's God. God speaking. It's a prophecy. Who is he speaking to? I take hold of your hand. He's speaking to someone. I protect you and make you a covenant mediator for people. What's a mediator? For what purpose? Uh huh. It's where two people are like fighting with each other. A mediator comes in and negotiates, finds a solution that can bring them back together again. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like if you and your friend are fighting and you have another friend, they might come in and go like and try to like say, well, you know, like get some kind of common ground and like you guys can be friends again. That's, that's a mediator. So he says, I will, I protect you and I make you a covenant mediator. You're going to mediate my covenant. You're going to bring two people together with me, somebody with me for the peoples and a light to the nations. And the word nations, it's Gentiles. A light to the Gentiles. To open blind eyes. So who is God speaking to, do you think? Jesus, yeah. He's speaking to Jesus. He's going to mediate the peoples is probably the Jews, Israel, and it's going to mediate between them and God, but really for everyone. And he's going to be a light to the nations. To open blind eyes, to release prisoners from dungeons, those who live in darkness. I'm pretty sure Jesus quotes this actually later on in the Gospels. 
So this is God speaking to Jesus. A little bit later in Isaiah, it says, So now the Lord says, the one who formed me from birth to be his servant, he did this to restore Jacob to himself so that Israel might be gathered to him. And I will be honored in the Lord's sight, for my God is my source of strength. He says, Is it too insignificant a task for you to be my servant, to re-establish the tribes of Jacob and restore the remnant of Israel? I will make you a light to the nations so you can bring my salvation to the remote regions of the earth. We're pretty much there in the remote regions of the earth. Who's speaking? Who's that? What do you think? Read it. Yeah. So now the Lord says, the one who formed me from birth to be his servant. So this is now Jesus talking about his father, right? He did this. Why did he do this? Why did he create Jesus? Or like, well, not create Jesus. (laughs) Did not create Jesus. Why did Jesus become man? Be, Be born, basically, as a servant. To restore Jacob to himself. Who's what's that? So to bring to restore Jacob. That's back to that mediating, right? They're broken. Their relationship is broken. We need somebody to mediate, so that Israel might be gathered to Him, to God. I will be honored in the Lord's sight. This is Jesus speaking. For my God is my source of strength. He says, "Is it too insignificant a task for you to be my servant to re-establish the tribes of Jacob and to restore the remnant of Israel?" So again, restoring Israel. I will make you a light to the nations. So he's quoting God, talking about Him and the job that he's given him to do, so that you can bring my salvation to the remote regions of the earth. And then there's one more. And that's basically what Simeon said, to bring revelation to the Gentiles and to bring glory to Israel, is what this little light, this Jesus is going to do. And then later in Isaiah, and I love this, it says, Arise, shine, for your light arrives. The splendor of the Lord's shines on you for look darkness covers the earth and deep darkness covers the nations but the lord shines on you his splendor appears over you nations come to your light and kings to your bright light so anyway point is this was always god's plan to bring glory to israel and to bring light to the nations salvation to the world Okay, read the the next bit. So the child's father and mother were amazed at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, Listen carefully, this child is destined to be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be rejected. Indeed, as a result of him, the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul as well. Okay, so... Apparently, Mary and Joseph are amazed at what the Simeon has to say about their little baby. And I think uh, it kind of goes back to the shepherds. Like, up until this point in Mary and Joseph's life, this thing with Jesus has pretty much been a completely personal, private thing. Nobody else, I don't know how many other people they told. And of the people they told, I can't imagine very many of them believed them. And so it must have been something quite amazing, like with the shepherds, to have this guy in the temple come up to them and just start proclaiming things that, as far as they knew, nobody else knew, or at least nobody else believed, you know? It would have been really, really cool and quite encouraging that that this little son of theirs is the Messiah, the future king of Israel. But unfortunately, uh, that's not where Simeon ends, because he had a few more things to tell them, to warn them about. He said, this child is destined to be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel. Basically, if you accept Jesus, you trust him with your life, then he will be the cause of your rising. Quite literally, he says, this is the will of my father. Everyone who looks on the son and believes in him must have, will have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Literally, Jesus is going to raise you to life if you believe in him. 
if you trust him. And there were many, there were many people in Israel who discovered this at that time, who did believe in Jesus and did find life in him. But unfortunately, there were many, many more in Israel who didn't. Um, and for them, Jesus was a rock that they were going to trip over and fall. The, this is probably referencing Isaiah, where God says, you must recognize the authority of the Lord of heaven's armies. That's Jesus. He is the one you must respect. He is the one you must fear. He will be a sanctuary, salvation, a place to be safe. But to both the houses of Israel, he will be a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. He will become a trap and a snare to the residents of Jerusalem. Many of them will stumble and will fall and be broken. Um, and that verse is also quoted in Peter. But basically this like, what? Again, if, for those who accept Jesus, Jesus is life and brings life and is rising. But for those who don't, he doesn't. And you see that even in the Gospels. You have like two criminals crucified with Jesus. One of them blesses Jesus, life, and the other blasphemes him. You've got it with like Peter and Judas. Both of them betrayed Jesus. Peter repented and was restored, and Judas hung himself, you know? So you see this contrast, and that is essentially Jesus is like forcing people to choose. Are you with me or are you against me? Yeah, and that either is rising or falling. But there's more to it than that. He says he will also be a sign that will be rejected. Literally, it's a sign that will be spoken against, that will be argued against, that will be denied or contradicted. Now, interestingly, the Pharisees again and again and again were asking Jesus for a sign, right? Some sign, some miracle, it's the same word, that will allow us to believe that you are who you claim to be. That's despite them having seen him like he did heaps of miracles, Right? And in fact, the reason they decided to kill him was because of all the miracles he was doing. But like he's doing all of these signs, what are we going to do? Everybody's going to believe in him. And that's the reason they decide to kill him. And so they saw lots of signs, but they keep saying like, give me a sign, give me a sign. Jesus obviously understood what was going on. And so what he said to them was, an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was in the belly of the huge fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. What's he talking about? Resurrection. Yeah, so he's basically saying like, I've done, he did lots of signs. I've done lots of signs for you. But there's one that's going to matter above all else, and it's this one. It's the sign of Jonah. Like Jonah was in the fish for three days and three nights. I'm going to be buried for three days and three nights. And then resurrection. Resurrection is everything. And even today, like that is the one sign that people spend all their time arguing against. Who rises from the dead? You believe that, he, that Jesus rose from the dead? But like, well, yeah, obviously like, if everybody rose from the dead, then there'd be nothing special about Jesus rising from the dead. You know, it's the fact that he rose from the dead is what proves that he is who he said he was, that he is the Messiah. And so that's the sign that ultimately people reject, that people deny, that people spent the last 2000 years arguing about and arguing against. But then he says he will also be as a result of him, the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. That, that again, that's what light does, right? It reveals, it allows you to see things. And he says that Jesus is going to reveal the, the motivations of our hearts. Again, Jesus like forces you to take sides. Are you with him? Or are you against him? And what you decide reveals something about the, what's going on inside, what your motivations are. Now, there's another like kind of cool link in here because in the book of Hebrews, it says, The word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, 
piercing even to the point of dividing soul from spirit and joints from marrow. It is able to judge the desires and thoughts of your heart. So apparently God's word is sharp, can pierce right down deep into your soul and figure out what it is, what the thoughts and desires of your hearts are, good or bad, yeah? Who or what is the word of God? Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So again, full circle. It always comes back to Jesus. Okay. But not only will that sword pierce, can that sword, which reveals our, the thoughts of our hearts, pierce our hearts, Simeon says that a sword is going to pierce your soul as well. Mary. What do you think that's talking about? That she will believe in God. She will? She'll believe in Jesus as well. Believe. believe. I don't think that's what's implied here. I mean, she, she did. She will be what is this? persecuted as well. It's going to be her, right? Yeah. I think this is a warning to her. Like, if it wasn't obvious already, being the mother of the Messiah is not going to be easy. It was going to be painful. And there's probably nobody else on earth who, whose heart broke as much to see Jesus rejected by everybody from a little boy and then to have to actually watch her son that she loved bleed and die on a cross, you know? Yeah. Okay, one more little bit and then we'll finish. You read this bit? There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old, having been married to her husband for seven years until his death. She had lived as a widow since then for 84 years. She never left the temple, worshipping with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came up to them and began to give thanks to God and to speak about the child to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Right, so Jesus had one more admirer in the temple that day, and it was this old lady, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, which is uh, literally means like the face of God, of the tribe of Asher. And it's interesting to me that Luke gives so much detail about who she was. Like, I don't know if maybe she was known at the time that he was writing, at least by legend, she wouldn't have been alive anymore because we're told she was very old. Literally, the Greek says, very old in her many days. She was old. And this verse 37 is like there's some ambiguity as to exactly what it means, but mostly people believe it means what this sounds like, which is that she was married for seven years, then her husband died, and he'd been dead for 84 years, which would make her 91 years since she got married. So assuming she's like 15 when she got married, this would make her about 106 years old. At the time that Jesus came, yeah, which is pretty, it's old. Uh, and we're told that she never left the temple, but spent all of her time there worshiping God, fasting and praying. I don't know actually what that means. Like, I assume she slept and did some, eat something, cause, but, or maybe she's just like, Ugh, I'm old now. I'm just going to spend the rest of my time devoted all to God. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. And it says that, I'll skip a little bit. At that moment, that moment that Simeon is telling Mary all these things that are going to happen through her son, she came up to them, saw Jesus, recognizes the Messiah, began giving thanks to God, and then apparently went and told everybody, everybody around there about him. Basically, sharing the gospel, she's evangelizing. Yeah. Now, there's something else in there that I would love to have studied, but there was like never going to be time. And it's these couple of phrases. Simeon was looking for the restoration of Israel and Anna shared with those who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Any idea what that would be talking about? As I said, there'd be a whole other study on its own. But basically, the people in Jerusalem were all waiting for the Messiah to come. 
But God had promised that the Messiah would restore Israel and bring salvation, redemption to his people. They thought that that was, well, anyway, as it turns out, there were two stages to God's salvation, the promises that he had made to Israel. The first stage was Israel as a nation were going to reject him, reject the Messiah. And salvation was then going to come to the nations, to the Gentiles. A remnant of Israel, a small number, were always going to believe in him, but most of Israel as a nation weren't. Stage one. Stage two, second coming, all of Israel accept the Messiah, Jesus, as their Messiah. And at that point, all of Israel is saved. And then the rest of, rest of God's promises to the Israelite, to the Jewish people will be fulfilled. But I said, that's a topic for another day. For now, we've now finished there. From here, we're going to be jumping back to Matthew next week. Wise man. And then the last little bit of Luke there is like where Jesus is a 12-year-old boy. And he goes and gets lost in this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, teachers in the temple or something. Cool. All right. Let's pray quick. Uh, Lord God, thank you again so much for your word. Um, I thank you in particular, Jesus, that you've given us your spirit, that we have you with us all the time and that you speak to us, Lord, that you reveal truth to us and that you, that you are a light in our life that can guide us, that we don't have to wander around aimlessly, hopelessly, Lord, but that we can move with confidence knowing that you've got our path laid out, Lord, and all we got to do is follow you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.